but it's an art. That's, that's what I love about it is that any kind of rebirth that we see in people, it's, it's artistic and you're empowering the, the person to say, you have the tools now figure it out. Um, no one's going to be able to tell you what works best for you. And it may not happen right away. It may not happen in two months or three months. It may happen in another year. I mean, we see transformations six months out after like, you know, just keep hammering away, start coming off of meds. And I think it's very important to understand that, to give people time and to continue to encourage them. A lot of people feel as though, well, I'm not fixed. I'm not healed. But when that aha moment comes, it's with work. Welcome to the Ignited Recovery Podcast, a new way forward for anyone looking for answers but feeling left out. If you've been searching for empowerment, triumph, and purpose, you've found them right here. You won't hear the same solutions and you're not going to have any excuses to fall back on because Ignited Recovery allows heroes to rise and become their best selves. I'm Dr. Adi Jaffe and I can't wait to be your guide on this journey. Are you ready to become an Ignited Hero? Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the Ignited Recovery Secrets Podcast. I am Adi Jaffe, and um, whoo, do I have a fun conversation with you guys today. Um, you may know this. I used to use a lot of drugs. I guess I still use some every once in a while, but I used to use a lot of them, and I used to sell them, and it used to be sort of everything that my life was about, um, and more and more of these drugs are making it into the world. We're going to talk about that throughout, and you've heard me talk about some of it, but today I've got a physician, an anesthesiologist, who does ketamine treatment. Ketamine treatment has been making the rounds and becoming more and more popular for depression, and so we're going to talk to him about this. You're going to listen in. You're going to learn more about ketamine. You're going to learn more about drugs. We talk about the drug war, so many different things. Um that I think are really interesting, not just if you struggle with depression and you're looking for a solution, although this will be really good for that as well, but more generally, if you either do use drugs and struggle with them, or use tr- drugs and don't struggle with them, or if you know somebody who does, hopefully this conversation will sort of shift your perspective about a lot of different things related to that. Hope you enjoy it. See you on the other side. I'm going to just kind of jump right into this. Okay. Um, for everybody listening right now, we've got Dr. Ken with us. Dr. Ken uh, works in sort of ketamine and infusion land. Um, and the reason I wanted to bring you on is, you know, it's really funny. I This may be like a, it's going to sound like a joke on the front end, but it's it's a serious start for me to the conversation. Yeah. You know, I used to sell drugs. Right. Um, and ironically, every almost every single drug other than meth, okay. although you can talk about Adderall. Yeah. Um, Every, almost every single drug that I used to sell is more and more being recognized as a therapeutic um, <laughs> method. And, I'm, you know, it's, it does kind of make me laugh. Like, I remember Sophie and I walked into a MedMen store here in L.A. recently. Right. And, you know, there's like bags of ounces of weed. And I'm like, I used to have those bags in my closet. And then mushrooms, you know, uh, psychedelic uh, psilocybin mushrooms are becoming more and more recognized for help with trauma and and therapeutic approaches and microdosing, et cetera. And we had uh, a guest on the podcast talking about those a few months ago. MDMA is being researched more and more for uh, trauma work. And I love that work. Sophie and I talk pretty openly about the fact that we've used it um, in the past for some of our own um, and, and her work through some sexual trauma and things of that nature. We're talking about ketamine and I, I used to sell ketamine, right? And like ketamine, um, I would, we would get it from these vets right. and it would be in vials and then I would cook it down. So it would become a powder uh-huh. uh, and people would consume the powder. And so I'm not, it's not that I'm, I'm not joking. It's just, it is ironic, right? That the drug war, if you will, the war on drugs in the country has been ongoing for decades, right? Since the right. Nixon camp, uh, since, since Nixon was in office. And I'm wondering your opinion before we get into ketamine itself, which I actually absolutely want to get into. I'm wondering your thoughts on this concept that maybe we sort of threw the baby out with the bathwater and just kind of started saying, hey, people misuse some drugs. So let's make every drug, except for alcohol, caffeine, and nicotine, by the way, right. um, illegal. Because then less people will use them. And we totally missed the mark because 
first of all, people kept using them. I sold it to those people. Um, we just made the prices higher, the quality uh, less reliable, and, uh, and, and the criminal element. We just allowed the criminal element right into it. Mm -hmm. And in the interim, maybe we missed out on some opportunities, yes, that are not supported by big pharma because there's not a lot of money in it, and yes, uh, that your insurance might not be really happy to pay for, et cetera, but missed out on opportunities for therapeutic methods that can help maybe millions of people. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, I'm not a big conspiracy theorist. I mean, I don't, uh, I don't jump into that. But um, when I do hear about um, how Timothy Leary and that whole um, sector of, of the West Coast just fell into the hands of um, uh, the authorities, because, again, like you said, during Nixon's um, presidency, we were going through the Vietnam War and there was free love and there was an awakening of uh, young Americans who were being sent off to Vietnam for a war that they didn't want any part in. And the conspiracy side of things for me, which I find interesting, I've listened to a lot of podcasts about it and read a couple of books um, on it, uh, are that you know, again, these, these are substances, LSD, psilocybin in particular, were, uh, were drugs that enlightened people and brought about a, a new view on, on what was really actually happening, what was a dynamic that was happening, and this, there was a rebellion. And why, why would, you know, the government allow that to happen when they needed soldiers? They needed all of these... Uh, they, they needed mm. people to fight this war, and Nixon and and eventually created the DEA, and and the story is is well written there. That that there is a control. It seems as though there needs to be a control of the the youth in, in at that time, so that we could thus have have kind of a uh, lambs to the slaughter, so to speak. And I think they were not, you know, the majority of, of Americans who were not uh, agreeable to the war were very conscious about that. And so I, I think that that's where it started. And if you look back at it, that the history of drugs that have become illegal, there is a reason for it. Um, and typically it has to do with the government wanting more control over something that's not necessarily dangerous maybe dangerous in another way that maybe not necessarily physiologically or, or, or uh, harmful to us, meaning that it's causing deaths. I can't, I don't, I don't know about an LSD death or a psilocybin death. That's for sure. Yeah. I mean, look, I, I know definitely not overdose deaths. I know of people who've done really dumb stuff oh, yeah. that they thought made sense because they were hallucinating on, on large enough quantities of LSD. But again, right. If you really think about it, partially that is because it's so dysregulated. Um, like I remember this, so I used to sell LSD as well. Yeah. Um, and I remember one time I was selling, it would, I would get vial, a vial, so liquid LSD. And I, I got it. It was like a, th I was the third person to touch it. So there was yeah. a lab that made it. Somebody right. bought quantity from them and I would buy it. And I was somebody that I was selling it to asked me, Hey, do you know the concentration? I'm like, do I yeah. look like the fucking <laughs> chemist that made this stuff? <laughs> right. No, I don't know. The, like, yeah. I don't know how many micrograms of LSD you're getting in a drop here. Right. And that's different than if it was regulated and you can actually 100%. give your patient a very controlled dose. Yes. And, and you know, you, you talked about the conspiracy version of it. I think conspiracy is one way to look at it. Sometimes just fear, anxiety, and paranoia is enough, in my opinion, to explain completely illogical, irrational human behavior. Um, you know, like the idea is because it's well-documented LSD and we'll get back to ketamine. I swear yeah, it's, it's right. well-documented that um, LSD was tested within the government, within uh, the CIA yeah, in the fifties. Yeah. To be used. So before it got really popular with people, it was tested by the government. It's just that the government experience didn't go where they wanted them to go. So right. now it was like this free floating molecule that people could do what they wanted to do with after the government taught a lot of people how to make it. Right. So, right. so now these labs were kind of set up where these researchers were set up to make it and there was no right. out outlet. There's no output to, even though it was just really magical substance, you know, people thought it could cure schizophrenia. There were a lot of really magical ideas about this drug. And 
And unfortunately, we live in a very puritanical society. Yep. So we can talk all we want about GDP and we can talk all we want about, maybe not right now, <laughs> we can talk all we want about America's leadership in World War II and all those great things, but we're also puritanical and, uh, and really, really scared of the idea even of the id or this kind of like internal force that wants to be hedonistic and, and just enjoy itself, let alone right. expand consciousness and worry about the cosmos more than it worries about fucking Biden versus Trump or whatever it is that's going on in the world at any given moment. I, I think it's going on now in a different, in a different way. I mean, um, you know, and again, we could find correlations to that period of time to, to this period of time, but it, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, an awakening and a social awareness about what we're doing. And, um, of course the government, you know, they don't want to hear that. And so conspiracy theorists and conspiracy theory aside, like you said, these are, these are compounds. I mean, LSD was produced by Sandoz back in the forties with Albert Hoffman. And you know, that yep. story is amazing. And so MDMA is another compound created in about the same period, late sixties started to be used in psychotherapy and, uh, you know, even just therapy offices as a, as an adjunct to be able to open people up emotionally. So these were being studied and used as tools before they were taken away from us. And I'm 100% with you on, I mean, I, you know, as an anesthesiologist, I'm big on dose, dose per weight. You know, I mean, it, it has to be, you have to know mushrooms are a little bit more difficult because they're naturally growing uh, uh, plant or fungus and we don't know the concentration. And so, Oh, I'll just eat a handful. You know, we know what happens then. I, w- I always tell people, look, you can always take more. <laughs> yes. So always err on the side of caution yes. and just take less, take less and wait longer. Yeah. Oh my God. Everybody has, I mean, now weed is legal, but like yeah. everybody has an edible story oh, yeah. where, um, where they ate some and were like, Oh, I don't feel this 25, 30 minutes later, ate a bunch more. And then within right. an hour and a half thought they There's were a 911 call. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so <laughs> I, I used to, I used to teach a class on addiction and I would, uh-huh. I would tell that to my students and you would see everybody just go, Oh my God. And they would, yeah. they would just want right. to tell you the story. Cause it was the most yes. anxiety provoking paranoid oh, yeah. panicked state they'd ever been in. So right. yes, dose matters. Um, the state of the person matters, the setting matters, right? We know that state and set, uh, but let's move, let's move into ketamine, right? Because sure. so when I sold ketamine to people, it's a pretty escapist drug. It's an anesthetic. It's a veterinary or small child anesthetic typically, right? Right. Um, yep. And, you know, people talk about being in a K-hole, et cetera. I want to get, I want to really refine some of these terms for people throughout the rest of our discussion and get your opinion on these things. You know, when people would buy from me, but again, they're mm-hmm. going to a drug dealer to buy it. They're not going to a physician. Um, right. It was a very escapist drug. It's, um, mm-hmm. it's a very strong anesthetic. Yeah. And when you use it at high enough doses, it sort of creates this, it's a dissociative anesthetic. So it creates this mm-hmm. separation between you, the physical you and the right. world around you. Right. And for a lot of the clients that I, I would sell it to, they use it as an escape. Sure. And I, you know, an interesting uh, fact about ketamine is that the reason why it was created was because we had lots of deaths of soldiers in the field in World War One and two, when we were using morphine and it was intramuscular injection. It was one dose and, you know, it was given to a 200 pound guy or 150 pound oh, wow. guy or, you know, and so I didn't know that. it's a respiratory depressant. As you know, opioid deaths are, that's why people are dying in the streets. Um, they needed a safer drug in the field. So they created this drug and the first drug actually was PCP. And the PCP, very closely know, related compound. Very closely. I mean, the only two drugs that are in that class. Yep. So PCP was the first attempt and then ketamine was created uh, shortly after with less hallucinations, less um, intense dissociation, but it was a very safe drug in the field because it doesn't decrease your blood pressure, doesn't decrease your heart rate, and it doesn't decrease your respiratory drive. All of the same reasons why you want to use it in a vet's office or a pediatrician's ER 
or, you know, for suturing or something like that. So very safe drug, therapeutic windows wide, and also, you know, dosage. For people, again, so for people who aren't clear about therapeutic window being wide, it means your effective dose is very unlikely to kill you, uh, right. which is not necessarily the case with opiates, right? Exactly. I mean, it's very narrow. Yeah, we all, we've all heard about propofol after the whole like, yes. Michael Jackson debacle. Right. So yep. there are drugs that do the job, but you know, if you overdo it a little bit, um, might kill a person. Ketamine, you're saying, has a much broader window, so that doesn't happen. Yes. Yes. In fact, I think it's being used more and more in the field of, um, by paramedics and I know we've, for, heard, as we've a, heard about as that an, case. Yeah, as an opioid um, alternative because, you know, for the same reasons, the safety value. Also, if you have a combative uh, patient, you know, helps to calm them down. So lots of uses, right? It's, it's a great tool. But we found that it's got other uses than just an anesthetic. Yeah. And, you know, those were studies that we've been, been done about a decade ago, but they're all very small studies. And the reason why is because we don't have, I mean, it's, it's an old drug, 60s. No patent. And no one's going no one's to do big, giant studies on a drug that they can't patent. But J&J knew that over the last decade, they've seen lots of great uh, studies, although they've been small. Um, and instead of going and spending a lot of money on research and development, they developed Spravato, which is the nasal spray, yep. the racemic. They turned it on its axis, able to patent it, and then it was offered to psychiatrists and, and, and in, a, in a way that the FDA was going to regulate it. And without getting into the weeds on that, it, it kind of fell on, on a deaf ear because a psychiatrist isn't prepared to see a patient in the office, give them a nasal spray, put them over someplace on a couch so that they can, um, you know, experience something. It was just completely, you know, not parallel with yep. the way that the, the drug was developed. So yeah. we know that, that drug companies know it works. Uh, we know the FDA knows that it works. Um, and so the way that we administer it at, at Aluma is IV because I'm comfortable with the way that IV medications are administered, um, mainly because you can turn it off and within five to 10 minutes, it's gone. You know, I mean, they're still going to feel kind of a little lightheaded or woozy, but if they're having an uncomfortable or, or, or um, uncomfortable experience, then you can just turn it off. And so if, you, if you're in a clinic where you're giving an intramuscular injection, it's kind of ride it out. Mm. And, um, that can be very scary for patients. And so uh, our clinic is set up differently to specifically give, uh, IV ketamine. And I would say throughout the country, the 350 clinics that do a similar, um, uh, protocol that we do, uh, two different routes of administration, IM or IV. So intramuscular or, or, or through the vein. Yeah. 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 Um, most of the clinics I've heard of are IV. And again, for that same reason, dose control is easier. Yeah. The, yeah. the time, the time, the ability to just stop the experience if yep. you need to is, is so much yep. simpler. So walk me through, you've, you've run through some clients by now. You've, you've done this with, um, yep. some people. I'm always, I mean, I got my uh, PhD in psychology with emphasis in behavioral neuroscience. And so it's, it is an interesting, almost like side effect. The ketamine right. does what it does, that it, that it, uh, while being dissociative has this like reset quality, mm -hmm. um, right. in terms of depression. Do you have any sense as you're talking to clients? I mean, obviously clients are not going to really understand the, um, right. the neurological impact of the drug, but in terms of the subjective experience, what they're describing happens around ketamine infusions and why they help with their depression. Sure. So before I tell you that, you know, 18 months we've been open, over 1,800 uh, infusions, Amazing. Um, you know, with a 70 to 80 percent response specifically in depression. So um, response rate is incredible. Um, but to describe a dissociative state is almost like asking someone, well, describe your psychedelic experience 
in words. It's almost like trying to grasp a snowflake. Mm. And, and then by the time that you have it in your hand, it's, it's gone. And if someone has psychedelic experience and you're trying to describe it, somebody may have a little bit better of a, of a grasp. And that is definitely the challenge that we have when we have patients coming to us who've had no psychedelic experience, where I, I think we, of course, take time to be able to interview patients, be able to have them feel comfortable with uh, the way that we are going to infuse. And this is all done telemedicine and was done through telemedicine before COVID. Um, wow. But when they, when they do come in, you know, we make sure that they don't have any history of psychosis. If they're bipolar, they haven't had any psychotic swings. Um, but the vast majority of our patients do not fall on the, the lowest end of the spectrum where they're suicidal. Um, the vast majority of our patients are kind of smack in the middle of that bell-shaped curve where they've tried SSRIs without success or maybe decades of, of uh, medication changes. And so um, for us, we find that the dissociative state is that therapeutic state, but trying to describe it to someone who's never experienced it mm. is very difficult. So what we do is we typically have them come in for their first infusion have that infusion at a low dose, about a half milligram per kilogram, which is not going to cause dissociation. It'll cause, you know, that relaxation. I, okay. Yes, I, I get it. I feel, I feel like what, what that means, they come away with a lot of gratitude and appreciation, um, a lot of realizations for maybe their life and their, you know, maybe their uh, failing marriage that maybe they see something that is, uh, that they can really put. A, a different view on it and they then are primed to to have another phone call and say look this is what to expect mm. and what we typically see through a six series uh six infusion series um protocol is that that first infusion then is built up we increase the dose to maybe the third infusion they're starting to dissociate a little bit and that creates this feeling of surrender which we find to be very powerful a very powerful feel where they they experience it. And for some people, it's a very uncomfortable feeling because most people who have problems with anxiety or anxiety and depression or trauma, they get to that point and it can kind of feel dark because they feel as though I don't want to lose control. Thoughts, yeah. Yeah. I don't, and I don't want to feel like I'm drifting off away and my body's sensation is going away that I'm going to be in my head. And like you say, that it, that starts to bring up, we're losing ego and we're starting to bring up emotions that have been what I call trash compacted for, you know, decades. Mm. Those things that are the most under the surface that keep popping up are going to come up and we prime them for that. And of course we have, we have a network of, we make sure that they're plugged in with a therapist. Of course, if they're on meds, they're monitored by a psychiatrist, you know, I need to let everyone know on this podcast, I'm not a mental health provider. I'm a ketamine specialist, and but I do know quite a bit about this process sure. and, and, and we're able to coach people. One of the things that's coming up for me as you're talking is, you know, it's, I know it's coming up for me because I just went on a four-day silent retreat and the job of that was to quiet the noise around me yeah. so that the noise inside of me could sort of work its way through. And then by the mm -hmm. third day, it was three nights or three and a half days, really. But it was really only the last half of the third day where my brain had cleared itself enough to just be sitting there with thoughts. And what I'm right. hearing, and I don't, we can talk in the, in, about the positive slash negative slash whatever version of how we want to talk about this. Um, what I'm hearing is this is like a shortcut to get into a deep meditative state where most of us, right. if we're honest about it, we're just not disciplined enough or not um, practiced enough to mm -hmm. block out the outside world, provide ourselves right. with actual time and sit there and look inward without worrying about outside stimulation. The ketamine helps people get to that state. What you're calling a dissociative state is what my ex-drug user clients would mm -hmm. call the K-hole, right? Um, right. It is that place where you're unable to move. You right. can't distract yourself with action. You can't go pick up your phone. You right. can't go look at a TV screen. You're just inside. And now yeah. 
if you're going to be inside, you're going to have to sort of look at those things. Right. And over how many sessions is it six sessions over a month? It's typically six. I mean, that's, that's the NIH study from five years ago. Um, but I think that, you know, I agree with you. It is an inward, um, projection where you're, you're now with your, it, I, I kind of laugh about the, the fact that when you reach cruising altitude, that you're free to roam your consciousness, right? Mm. Um, it, it is in the unconscious state really with ketamine versus let's say a heroic dose of LSD or psilocybin where you actually are in, you're still in the conscious state. You may be in and out of that ego, you know, dissolution state. Um, but typical, doses uh, that are, you know, upwards of five for grams of, of dried mushrooms for psilocybin and hundred to almost 200 of mics of LSD. That's the dose range. I know we may be talking outside of the box here, but, but that's the, that's the, the conscious state you're able to work through issues and problems. And that, I've found that myself with, with ketamine, it, you're in the unconscious state. It's a dreamlike state. And when you come out of it, we oftentimes will make notes about how, what patients are saying, because it's almost like a dream yeah. that they're then thus waking up from and they're saying, gosh, I, I, I saw my brother. I haven't thought about my brother in five years. And, the, and we will make notes. They'll, we pass it along to them. They talk about those things with their therapist. They're like, yeah, I do remember that. I don't even remember saying that, but I do remember that thought. And it was beautiful. I was able to reconcile you know, uh, you know, my mother's death and, and I felt a different feeling. It was happiness instead of sadness. Mm. So it's almost like a rewriting of, of a narrative in many ways for lots of different patients where they, uh, another interesting thing for me is with ketamine, your frontal cortex is flooded with glutamate. And we know that glutamate is important in forming memories yeah. that you're able to reform a memory in the subconscious state. Oh, wow. To rewrite that narrative that mom, you know, whatever it might be. I mean, we can, you know. So that would, that would speak to some of the long-term effects because if you're able to actually create or at least um, increase the probability of some neuroplasticity in those areas, right. during those states, then through repetitive exp uh, experiences, you would be able to kind of revisit some of these old triggers, some of these old right. activating events, maybe even some old traumas and, um, and kind of work them through in this dis dissociative state. So again, not distracted, not protected by the ego. What are people going to think if I talk about this? What are, yes. you know, what are people going to, um, how are people going to look at me? If I, if I mention this to them, it's all kind of self enclosed within your head, right. which allows yeah. there to be maybe a more honest exploration. Yeah. So to speak to that dissociative state and, and what we try to encourage patients to do now, I mean, this is part of our protocol. We don't force patients to do this, but it's important that when we first opened, we have a 50 screen inch TV. It plays a, na a nature video with, you know, drone footage or, and they put it on their favorite playlist. I mean, I've gone through this series myself as my partner, Ali has, you know, as we're life partners as well. And realize that listening to familiar music brings you out of that state. It suddenly sparks a memory of maybe it could be a good feeling or a bad feeling. You know, so we've now kind of made it so that we listen to, you know, recommend binaural beats and we have various different playlists of that to get our brain primed to be able to get you deeper into the dissociative state and to maybe wear an eye mask instead of, of looking at something at looking at something. And so, um, that seems to be very helpful. We also have a premeditative in intention setting, um, video with meditation that they're watching as they're getting their ID put in. So we're trying to soften it up, bring down, you know, to the parasympathetic state so that yeah. it's, everything's optimized. I love it. And where are you guys located again? Just so everybody knows, um, Austin, Texas, we're, um, just North of the UT campus. Um, there's a hospital system, uh, called St. David's. We're right at the, you know, highway thoroughfare, I-35 that's right there. So, um, very convenient for, you know, most of central Texas. Love it. Um, so talk to me, I mean, you've done, you've done that many infusions. You've seen clients over the last 18 months. Um, right. and you know, you've been studying up a lot about this around protocols. 
my, what I've heard, so I haven't done one. Maybe when I come to Austin, I'll, I'll yeah. hit you up and we'll, uh, Please we'll do, it. do one together. Mm-hmm. But, um, what I've heard in the past is that people who see benefit from this do return to it periodically, like a, uh, again, like a practice, right? Like I'm going right. to probably go do these, uh, these silent retreats three or four times a year because right. once you find tools that work for you. So speak to that a little bit, because I think people have this, I don't know if it's a misguided notion, but it's people feel like, well, if the medication works, it should work forever. Or right. If right. Gonna, well, if this thing really helps depression, it should cure for the rest of my life. Yeah. Where in reality, I don't know that we know that anything ever does anything forever. Right. <laughs> Sorry right. if anybody had a hard time understanding that phrase, but I don't think that anything ever does anything forever. Right. <laughs> it's um, if you have a meditation practice, you practice it every day. It yeah. works because you practice it every day. Uh, if you like antidepressants and they've done it for you, if you stop taking them, they haven't fixed the problem most of the time. Right. Um, now, sometimes they do like my, when my dad was sick with cancer and he was dying, I ended up, and he passed, I ended up taking antidepressants for about four months, but yeah. that was to overcome a very specific period, right? right. Um, exercise the same, right? If you find out that you really like oh, yeah. running, guess what? You can't run a marathon. Then you go, cool, I ran a marathon. I never need yeah. to run again. Yeah. What have you found in terms of return to the therapy or things of that nature for people who have found it to be efficacious and, and work for them? Well, um, I mean, that's a great question because of course we have a bell shaped curve of those people. Um, you know, our patients sometimes come in after, you know, 10 to 20 years on uh, an antidepressant or multiple different antidepressants. Those patients aren't going to be six infusions. They're going to be eight to 10. And then they'll have maybe another one in another month and another one in another month. And then they start to see, uh, some change. We work with um, uh, a couple of different um, practices in Austin that are key on trying to wean off of SSRIs. I personally am not a big fan of them. Um, I have been tried. I have a, I have a mutation in, 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 in a gene, MTHFR. I cannot methylate sure. and I can't take SSRIs. I, I tried for eight months and it was uh, pretty horrendous. But knowing that, um, our brains are, it's going to change your brain architecture and it decreases your receptor density on your neurons. And, you know, those are serotonin receptors. And so those are the patients that we really want to have, uh, small breakthroughs. They're not going to have these gigantic breakthroughs, like say the CEO who's come in, who's abused Adderall, who's running life on the rails. He's attained every, uh, goal and, and financial, you know, accolade that he possibly can. And then suddenly it's like, I'm not happy. Yeah. What's wrong with me? I'm depressed. Uh, and, and those, those people, uh, I won't say are easier. I just think that it's a, it's a completely different shift. Sure. And, and I think that it still has the common thread and that common thread is what kind of life do I want to live? And am I going to be active in the process after my infusions? This, uh, we, that's the first thing that we say. Ketamine is not going to cure you. This is a tool, just like meditation, just like EMDR, just like um, yoga, just like exercise, yeah. nutrition, sleep, all of those things yeah. are things that we talk about. And we partner with practitioners who are believers in all of those things. Um, because those are needed, but as you know, people, I mean, if you're an addict and a hardcore addict, you're, you're not going to be thinking of yoga. You're going to be thinking of getting off the drug and it's going to be baby steps after that. And it's the same way with anybody who's got major depression and they're just having their lives changed and they're relooking at their relationship or the way that they've approached life. But I do believe that it is a huge, um, leap forward for people to get a reset and to have a new view on, on what they've been doing and how they've been living. Yeah. I love it. I, you know, at Ignited, we're pretty agnostic when it comes to the specific tools that people find. And what I mean Mm -hmm. by that is it's the outcome that we really care about, right? So we care about people finding the toolkit. I always say this, just the toolkit that serves them. Some people try yoga and they run out screaming and crying going, I will never do that again in my life. (laughs) Other people love it. Um, 
some people do meditation, freak out and never do it again. Some people start mindfulness and lead to meditations. Other people have medications incorporated into it, you know, naltrexone, if it's alcohol, ketamine, like all these different tools. Right. And obviously there's CBT and EMDR. Yeah. There's all these different tools. Um, I don't know that anybody's ever going to find a silver bullet that sort of works for everybody to fix everything. But it's an art. That's, that, that's what I love about it is that, you know, um, any kind of rebirth that we see in people, it's, it's artistic. It's, it, you, and you're empowering the, the person to say, you have the tools, now figure it out. Yeah. Um, no one's going to be able to tell you what works best for you. And it may not happen right away. It may not happen in two months or three months. It may happen in another year. I mean, we see transformations six months out after like, you know, just keep hammering away, start coming off of meds. And I think it's very important to understand that, that that's a, that that is to give people time and to continue to encourage them. A lot of people feel as though, well, I'm not fixed. I'm not healed. Um, but when that aha moment comes, it's with work. They've realized mm. I did the work and that's what it was. It wasn't just ketamine. It was a combination of all these different things. I love that. And thank you. I think, I think that's, that's the lesson for everybody, right? Is there are all these tools out there. I love, like we started out this conversation. I love that these things that were relegated to criminal, um, oh, yeah you know, criminal misdeeds up until pretty <laughs> recently are now right. being rediscovered. And as you pointed out, and thank you so much for that, right? Just so we're clear, each one of these drugs that are illegal were created legally in labs the vast yeah. majority of times for a specific use. Mm -hmm. And again, we go back, right, to the idea that if you stop fear, if you stop yourself from paranoia and anxiety that maybe I will never find the solution or maybe this thing will be abused. You can get back into the place of saying, does this thing serve me in my life? Does it make my life better or not? And if it does, ketamine might be one of those solutions for you, especially if you have resistant um, depression and, and a lot of other things haven't worked in the past. Yeah. And one of the things that we do do is also microdose. So, I mean, there's several ways that we do that. There's a nasal spray, there's a, a, you know, a lozenge and they have different concentrations and we, you know, try to coach through the therapist or through the psychiatrist utilizing this as, as a way to be able, especially with alcohol, we've seen fantastic results with alcoholics or other, you know, um, addicts who want and have that reflexive pick something up, um, the thing about ketamine is when someone receives ketamine in a, or ketamine infusion series and they see that, that there is a change, remember, it's not a long-lasting drug. So if they see a change a week later, that means that, in them. you know, yeah. That's and and what we know about ketamine is that it, is, it, has, it causes secretion of BDNF, which is brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And as you know, anxiety, depression, and trauma, and other things cause the hippocampus to atrophy. And if we can wake those neurons up, have patients really start to dig in and, and do the work, they're going to start refiring. Yeah. And that's, that's another extreme, extremely beneficial aspect of ketamine, because we know if they microdose, and then they're mindful of it. I mean, one of the things that I love to do is float in an isolation tank. Yeah. And microdosing with ketamine in an isolation tank allows me to revisit those deep states and, uh, and it's meditated. Do you find a difference between the dissociative state that is there from a full dose of ketamine and the uh, tank float? Yes, but I, I feel just like I've never been able to meditate to the point of being able to reach those transcendent states that you hear so many yoginis speak of. However, you know, again, ketamine, a pharmacologic assistance to be able to sit in a float tank. I mean, right after work, let's say on a Friday, and I try to go float in a float tank and, you know, it's going to take me longer than an hour to try to get out of that, you yeah. know, my rumination cycle. Uh, you know, so ketamine, that's one of the big benefits is any kind of, uh, I mean, it's, it's that rumination 
between the hippocampus and the frontal cortex that you're trying to sever, whether it be a suicidal ideation or an eating disorder or uh, obsessive compulsive disorders, things that we know prevent. I mean, there's a reason why the default mode network is inactive when we're doing something, Mm. you know, when we are in an active state, it shuts off. And so when you're busy, you know, that's why OCD is extinguished when you're washing your hands or you're doing so. I mean, you're doing something actively to turn off the default mode network so that that rumination cycle is severed, at least temporarily. Yeah. It gives you some relief temporarily. And so that's another important thing that ketamine has been found to be the best drug for extinguishing suicidal ideation beyond anything else mm. within 24 hours. So powerful. So yeah. Powerful. Thank you so much, man, for coming on here and talking about this. You know, five years ago, 10 years ago, <laughs> these discussions about ketamine were very experimental and fringe. Yeah. Uh, it's really nice to see more tactics and more tools and more therapeutic options for the people who struggle. Um, I love the work and I'm not kidding. Maybe if uh, next time we're in Austin visiting, I'll hit you up. Um, oh, yeah. For I've, sure. uh, I've, I've never had a ketamine infusion. I've definitely used ketamine, like I said, back in those yeah. days. But uh, it would be very interesting to kind of see this therapeutic experience of, you know, binaural beats. and Right. And, um, and feeling, feeling safe. I mean, the, when you have an infusion uh, and you have someone in the room and you know and feel that there are eyes on you, um, there is a bond that is formed between that person watching over you mm. and, uh, and the person receiving the infusion. Oh, yeah, and that, we see point. that very commonly. I mean, like, you know, most doctor's offices are the same way. The person that's caring for you, there's a place in your heart that, you know, I feel safe when I'm here. And that's, that's what point. we're trying. That's what we're trying to develop from the very algo. I mean, when you open, you open your doors, that's what you want. Um, when someone's entrusting you with that. It's a really good point. So again, thank you so much for the work. Um, I love yes. it. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing kind of people's response to this. I know ketamine has been talked about more and more and more, but I think we got into some, some of the background info of how, how this, uh, these techniques got developed and that's, uh, yeah. really, really cool. And so we'll have links for your clinic, uh, et cetera. Okay, great. It's again, I'm really glad we got connected and being able to expose the work that you do to the Ignite community. Yeah. And of course, you know, as you know, I've been a follower of yours for at least three or four years and, and really do connect with your, your, uh, view on addiction and, and, uh, and the, and the, and the work that you do. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. Yeah. Um, Hey, the goal is always just to help as many people as we can. Right. I totally agree. That's it. Um, for everybody who's listening right now, Ken, do you have your own uh, Instagram handle or um, or one for the clinic? Which one is best? Yes, I mean if they, it's two L's and two M's, and it's at Aluma dot com. Right. Um, two L's, two M's, uh, and and then Instagram. It's it's the same face Facebook. Love it. So for everybody right now, tag us, tag at Dr. D. Jaffe, tag at Ignited.me, tag at Aluma doc. Okay. And, yeah, uh, absolutely. We'll get on. Yeah, and just let us know. Yeah, how this landed. I mean, I'm, I know there are a lot of you listening right now who struggle with depression yourself. So I'd really love to hear what came up for you as you were listening. Yeah. To and it, we depend on social media. We depend on social media to be able to get the word out because 90% of the people that come to us are self-referred. You know, psychiatrists are referring. It's we're right still in the grassroots of things. And as you know, Social media is important uh, and getting the word out and just doing podcasts like this, Absolutely. talking with providers, you know, it's, Absolutely. It's helpful. I love it, so man. Thanks again. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, everybody listening right now, tag us, let us know how it is, leave a review and uh, see you next week. Thank you for tuning in to the Ignited Heroes Recovery Podcast. I really hope you found the information here useful and that we'll see you back here next week. And look, I want to make sure that this podcast is the most useful it can be for you. So please let me know by emailing info at ignited.com if there are any specific topics or questions you'd like to have addressed. As usual, if you like this episode, I would love for you to leave us a five-star review and rating. Thanks, and see you next week.